Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so this is going to sound like it's coming out of left field. So I don't really expect this video to perform exceedingly well on the channel, uh, but it's one that I've been wanting to make for a long, long time for a couple of different reasons. The first may or may not become clear depending on which direction WandaVision goes. And the second is because of the direction that WandaVision is going in and the fact that I think they're gonna launch Project Wide Awake. But here on Comics Explained, because we're trying to create a clear line between Comics Explained and Pop Culture Explained, Pop Culture Explained, we'll talk about how WandaVision ties into all this, right? here on. Com Thomas explained, we're just going to explain Project Wide Awake. So Project Wide Awake was a long-standing concept in Marvel Comics that had been around for a long, long time. It initially was introduced with New Mutants issue number one, which was as good a time as any, given the nature of the organization. The fact that Chris Claremont, Louise Simonson over at Marvel wanted to kind of expand the idea that mutants were a credible threat on Earth and that different governments and things like that were trying to find a way to crack down on them and, and so on and so forth. So for a long, long time in Marvel Comics, we didn't really know the origin of Project Wide Awake. All we knew was that somewhere along the line, the government looked at, at mutants as a credible threat and then went forward accordingly. This is one of the significant things that came out of the story, Adam, The Legend of Blue Marvel by Kevin Grievous, which was basically the idea that Blue Marvel was the reason why Project Wide Awake came into existence, or at least was, was implemented on a solid level by the various governmental authorities who were out there. So the idea here is that when, when Adam Brashear popped up on the scene as a superhero uh, and the world learned that he was a black man, of course, as most of you guys know from the Adam Legend of Blue Marvel story, the president, uh, President Kennedy at the time, ultimately asked him to step down. But in the aftermath of that, in the aftermath of Blue Marvel, the concern being that as a black man, if he had sided with like the civil rights movement, for example, and decided to topple the American government, there would have been nothing they can do. And this led to a string of thoughts that were taking place in the Pentagon, which was, well, what happens if it's not somebody who's part of the civil rights movement? What happens if it's like a communist? Or what happens if it's a person who's disillusioned with the government and is just crazy and has the power to take the government down? and there's nothing we can do to stop them, right? It turned into a to an argument of preservation, right? Of saying like, what would happen if there were a being out there who for whatever reason chose to target the US government and destroy us and there's nothing we could do to stop them? How do we respond to that? And so what you ended up getting was a couple different things happening at the same time. The first one was a guy by the name of Judge Chalmers, who was a federal judge. And because of the fact that he was existing friends with Bolivar Trask combined with his own concerns about mutant related issues and issues coming off the tail of Adam Brashear, he had commissioned a five year study that was designed to basically analyze the mutant population, the potential powers that mutants could have, and not really to allow flights of fantasy, which is like, what if we had one that could alter reality, but to look at existing evidence and to determine whether or not mutants were a credible threat in the United States. Now, Senator Robert Kelly had done the exact same thing, but the difference here is that federal judge Chalmers really didn't have any stake in the five-year plan that he had done outside of just analyzing whether or not this was a credible threat on a legal level, right? To kind of get the legal wheels in motion so that if mutants were arrested, for a particular crime to answer the question like do they have the same human rights as everybody else different things like that right you know are they bound by the same laws as the non-mutant citizen who's out there senator kelly had done it because he was staunchly anti-mutant and was looking for a reason to be able to launch a campaign to basically rally those individuals who were against mutants right because at the time mutants were slowly rising into prominence they weren't necessarily huge there wasn't a ton of them out there that people knew it wasn't really until the early 1960s going forward that suddenly like the the number of mutants that existed out there just started exploding in number. And a lot of that's because of what, what I refer to as the, the quote unquote ticking clock that the Celestials had put into the genes of humans that at some point along the line, mutants would begin to manifest. But regardless of, of how you slice it, Senator Kelly knew that there was a lot of anti-mutant fear that existed out there in the country because people are afraid of what they don't understand. If he could rally that fear and use that fear for his own ends to become president of the United States, that's basically what he would do. And that's exactly what he did do. And so what you ended up having was this kind of idea, right? These different studies, one that came from Senator Kelly, one that came from federal Judge Chalmers, which basically just sat on desks, right? That's that's all it was. It was just this great big huge report that just sat on a desk somewhere or sat in a, in a drawer somewhere and nobody really gave it any real thought until you got to the actions of Mystique and her Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Now, this happened in Uncanny X-Men issues 141, 142 with some lead up in issues 139 to 140. And a lot of you guys probably know this story as something called the Days of Future Past, but this is basically a story 
story where Mystique and her second brotherhood, which actually would eventually go on to become Freedom Force, uh, where they had basically attacked Senator Robert Kelly, Moore McTaggart, and Charles Xavier. And the intention was to assassinate them, to basically demonstrate to people that mutants should be feared, right? Mutants are like the next stage of human evolution. It was a more militaristic stance that fell more in line with the idea of Magneto. And so the result of this is that you had the initial timeline, the original timeline for Days of Future Past, where the, uh, where the assassination was successful. But this led to the launch of Project Wide Awake and the creation of the Sentinels under Bolivar Trask, which basically became autonomous and then rationalized that because mutants are an offshoot of humanity, basically the next stage of human evolution, that mutants are in fact human. And so it led to Sentinels basically conquering the entirety of the United States and enslaving both humans and mutants. And then at the end of that story, you had a, a change in the timeline where Rachel Summers, the alternate reality daughter of Jean Grey and Cyclops, sending the mind of Kitty Pride into the past to stop Days of Future Past from happening, which was successful in, in, in her attempt. And so what this meant was that according to like the main Marvel timeline as we see it, the assassination attempt of, of Mystique and her Brotherhood of Evil Mutants was unsuccessful. And while it did not lead to Days of Future Past, what it did lead to was people coming to the realization that like they should read the study of Judge Chalmers and the studies of, of Senator Robert Kelly. And they did. And this basically led to the formation of Project Wide Awake. Now, Project Wide Awake was a multifaceted intelligence and law enforcement operation, which was for the most part completely and totally illegal. But the commission was headed by the, the National Security Advisor of the United States. And then of course you had Henry Peter Geirich who worked for the National Security Council, who was head of the operations for Project Wide Awake. So making sure they did their own thing. But as far as this operation goes, the main charter was to contain and to control. And so the, ba the, the basic gist was to analyze the entirety of the mutant threat to find a way to either contain it, to make sure they don't become a credible threat to the United States, or if at all possible, control the mutant threat. And that's what you saw happen on Genosha, right? The island of Genosha where mutants were basically kidnapped and taken to that location and then thrown there and used as a labor force. Now, ultimately, they were all eventually freed and that led to Genosha becoming kind of a safe haven for the mutant population where you had like 16 million mutants who lived there until Cassandra Nova like massacred them all, right? It was insane. She literally killed 16 million mutants in the span of like four hours. It was it was absolutely bonkers. But as far as the individuals in the organizations that composed Project Wide Awake, everybody was part of this. So you basically had the CIA, you had the FBI, you had State Sheriff's Office, you had the uh, Special Assistant to the National Security Advisor, you had the National Security Council, you had local law enforcement, the whole nine yards. It was a multifaceted illegal operation, which was never really challenged by anybody. One, because Judge Chalmers kind of kept, you kind of stood in the way of anybody presenting a, a credible court case to this. And two, it just never got to the Supreme Court, right? So there was never really anybody out there to make the argument that it couldn't be done. That and the fact that it was kind of pitched as something that was in the interest of national security. So it was very easy for the, the federal government to put a lot of red tape around things and to basically shut down anybody's ability to look into anything that they deemed to be top secret, right? Because at that point, the Freedom of Information Act didn't exist. So you couldn't go to a court and say, give like, I want all the information that, that exists for uh, Project Wide Awake and the court would compel the government to hand it over. The result of this is that Project Wide Awake was a very quiet project or a very quiet system that existed out there to monitor mutants, to contain mutants, and to control mutants. That's what led to Bolivar Trask basically creating the Sentinel program as we know it. Now, one of the things to understand here, there's two generations, really even three generations of Sentinels. The first one is Bolivar Trask, which was spearheaded by virtue of Project Wide Awake. The second went into Stephen Lang. The third went into Operation of National Emergency, which we'll talk about that here in a minute. But the important thing to take away from all this is that with Bolivar Trask creating the Sentinels, it was the government's way of preparing themselves against various mutant threats that existed out there. Now, in the original X-Men stories by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, uh, Bolivar Trask and his Sentinels were defeated pretty easily. And so what this meant was that it was easy for the government to just kind of sweep Bolivar Trask under the rug and say, we didn't really know anything about what's going on. Obviously, we would never sanction anything like that. And under the guise of Project Wide Awake, secretly take all the information that belonged to Bolivar Trask and then hand it over to Stephen Lang. No relation to Scott Lang, Ant-Man, right? The two of them are not related. But, uh, but this basically led to Stephen Lang creating the more modern Sentinels that you're aware of. And so this led into like the Phoenix Saga, for example, when Stephen Lang uses Sentinels, the information given to him under Project Wide Awake by the federal government, the research of Bolivar Trask, and then basically going through capturing a whole bunch of X-Men, which led to the other X-Men going and rescuing them, and then all of them flying back to Earth, and then being hit by, by a cosmic storm, and then Jean Grey reaches out to the Phoenix, and then becomes a Phoenix, and so on and so forth, right? That's how all that stuff unfolds. Now, for the most part, following the defeat of Stephen Lang, Project Wide Awake kind of went away. You had a few things that were there, right? You had like Freedom Force, which is basically Mystique's Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, which received a kind of contract from the government that like all their crimes would be part 
hardened if they carried out like a series of tasks and things like that. So they basically became a kind of like government sanctioned. I wouldn't really say like a black ops team, like a black ops wet work team, but like you guys understand the gist of what they became. But for the most part, it kind of vanished. But all this came back in the aftermath of the Onslaught Saga. Now, a lot of you guys who don't know what the Onslaught Saga is, this was basically a story that was an answer to the question, what would happen if Charles Xavier's frustration with humanity's desire to coexist with humans merged with Magneto's pure hatred of humanity? What would that look like? And it looked like Onslaught, right? Just this, this crazy, awesome looking guy. He looked like Magneto if he was Super Shredder. He was really, really cool looking. Now, ultimately, Onslaught was defeated. But because of the fact that Onslaught raised the credible threat that like mutants are a lot more dangerous than humanity previously believed they were just because of everything we saw Onslaught do, taking over the entirety of New York, different things like that, almost conquering the world and, and in fact, moving beyond the earth potentially and conquering the universe, depending on whose power he'd gotten. Like if he had taken the power of Franklin Richards, Nate Gray, different people like that. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know what that means, they're just super powerful guys who can in some form or fashion manipulate reality on different levels. Uh, basically, it led to what was called Operation Zero Tolerance. Now, Operation Zero Tolerance was an event that happened in the aftermath of Onslaught, but it dealt with a guy by the name of Bastion. Now, Bastion was not really a person. Bastion was a machine that was originally composed of Nimrod, who was a sentinel from the future in the Days of Future Past event, and Master Mold, who was like the guy that made sentinels in the modern era. The two of them basically fused and they turned into Bastion as we know him. But in the aftermath of Onslaught, and because of the fact that Bastion wanted to see mutants eradicated, Bastion managed to successfully petition the federal government to allow him to, to basically reactivate quote unquote Project Wide Awake. The difference is that where Wide Awake was more of an intelligence gathering apparatus with a little bit of you know physical involvement in terms of launching attacks against mutants, Operation Zero Tolerance, the whole the whole idea of that was just outright genocide. And so it basically led to to of course you know Bastion and those guys being defeated. Uh, Senator Robert Kelly was the one who originally signed off on it and then ultimately changed his mind and said, no, 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 I'm not okay with wiping out the entirety of the mutant population on Earth. And then had Shield basically round up uh Bastion and those guys, and that was basically it, right? They were all just kind of captured, and Bastion did show up a little bit later on. But that was kind of like the the little tidbit of Project Wide Awake that you got during that time period. Now, following that, Project Wide Awake basically went away again, and then it came back. <laughs> now, in this instance, it came back in the aftermath of the events of House of M. Uh, most of you guys know this as the, the project codenamed One, O-N-E, or Operation of National Emergency. But the whole idea behind this was that because the Scarlet Witch had altered reality and people didn't really know why, one thing to keep in mind, most people following the events of House of M didn't remember the events of House of M, right? All they knew was that at some point, some weird thing happened. And that was it, right? The reality was that Scarlet Witch had taken Charles Xavier of the X-Men with these insane telepathic powers. She had used his mind to subconsciously figure out the thoughts of everybody on Earth and then altered reality to give everybody everything they ever wanted. At the end of that story, she basically said no more mutants. And it basically led to 98% of the mutant population losing their powers. And so in response to that, the federal government had two different ideas. The first one was to look at it from the perspective of, okay, mutants are actual citizens. By this point, Senator Robert Kelly had moved away from being staunchly anti-mutant and had actually become a supporter of mutant rights. Uh, and then at the same time, you had uh, a guy by the name of General Laser. He's not really important. The important thing is he was part of the group that believed that this was the best chance to eradicate the mutant population, right? I mean, previously, before, before the events of House of M, you had like millions of mutants. Now you had 198 of them and they were all at the Xavier Institute, right? Why not just nuke the place? <laughs> Now, of course, public sentiment at the time was such that it would not have gone over well for the federal government if they had just nuked the mutant population because um, the, the average non-mutant person, aside from the most extreme groups like Friends of Humanity or the right or any of those guys, they would have seen it as like kicking somebody while they're down, right? And so most people wouldn't have sided with that, which kind of kept the, the hands of General Laser tied to a degree. But the overall gist was with Office of National Emergency, they created what were called the One Sentinels, which were basically these manned sentinels. And they, they used that because they realized the problem with having any kind of sentinel out there that abides by programming is given events that we'd seen with like Master Mold, the potential for Days of Future Past, things like that, is that sentinels abide by absolute programming. They don't really understand new ones. And so when you look at things where, you know, Senator Robert Kelly and those guys learned that in an alternate reality, that sentinels come to the conclusion that mutants are effectively humans in the next stage of evolution, that mutants and humans are the same thing. And so they end up capturing, you know, and, and basically controlling the whole of North America. To prevent that from happening, they basically had people control the sentinels. And it kind of worked for the most part but the whole point behind that is you basically had them just sort of safeguarding the mutant population. Now I say safeguarding, but it was really more of just a prison, right? Mutants couldn't leave the Xavier Institute, but nobody could get in either, right? So they were as much prisoners as they were 
were, you know, people who were being protected. It's one of those weird and kind of wonky situations. But the reality is that's kind of where it stopped. Now, Office of National Emergency did kind of have a lot going on in terms of their role. It wasn't necessarily just Sentinels. It really was kind of safeguarding and protecting, having like manned men, soldiers that were guarding a perimeter, things along those lines. And they had a little bit of involvement later on. But as far as the whole of the Project Wide Awake uh, series of events, this is not really to be confused with something like Weapons Plus. It's not really to be confused with like the Commission on Superhuman Activities. It's not designed to be confused with those different things. Project Wide Awake was a wholly separate entity that was initially spearheaded by the government and then just kind of went away once it, once they realized that things like that just didn't work. In some ways, it was kind of replaced. For example, like if you look at the events of Civil War and you look at superhuman registration, superhuman registration required that anybody who had superpowers in the United States had to register their powers and their names and addresses, their information with S.H.I.E.L.D. So that kind of replaced the idea of the Commission on Superhuman Activities, the idea of like Project Wide Awake, even though Project Wide Awake was largely a, a anti-mutant or a mutant based concept. Mutants were kind of given a little bit of license by, by S.H.I.E.L.D. at the time, which didn't really matter because there were so few. The Office of National Emergency was already monitoring them anyway. Uh, so again, you know, as, as far as this goes, Project Wide Awake was a really, really cool concept that was born from the Chris Claremont era of X-Men, but over the years has just kind of faded away into oblivion and Marvel Comics. So with that being said, guys, uh, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you guys are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.